As I said, our topic is how do we know that God even exists, which is a great question. Now, just a show of hands before we do that. Um, it's important to know that when I'm speaking about God, I don't mean, you know, some old white guy with a white thobe and a white beard, you know, the kind of like the type that you see that's depicted on The Simpsons, right? By God, I mean something or a being that is intelligent and conscious. That's what I mean. What he looks like, what he, like, what he sounds like, that is beyond our discussion. But it's important to know that I'm not trying to prove that there's a man with a white beard in the sky somewhere. That's not what I'm trying to prove. I'm trying to prove that there's an intelligent being, a creator that exists somewhere out there. That's my argument. So just a show of hands, who here believes in something? Like something that made this universe, some, like whether you call it, whether we call it Allah or something else or something else, who believes something made the universe? This doesn't just come out of nowhere. Okay, most people, okay. So if I asked you, who can tell me what's the reason why you believe that? Anybody? Anybody, don't be shy. Anybody have any ideas? Yes, go ahead. It gives you life meaning. So you believe, in, you believe in God because it gives your, your life meaning. Okay, I think that's a, that's a great point because many people complain about feeling emptiness inside, which is why they turn to religion. But is that necessarily, like, what are the proofs? Like, what do, arguments do we hear that God actually exists in Islam? Or in any religion? Like, what are the arguments? Yeah. Okay. The complexity of at the molecular level and all that stuff. Okay, yeah. So pretty much my two arguments are going to be like the logical slash scientific argument and the scriptural argument. By this I mean the Quran, right? The argument that comes from the Quran. So I'd like to start off with a little story. So a couple weeks ago, I went to the United States. Um, Alhamdulillah, I went there to get married. Alhamdulillah, so for good reasons, not just tourism and to see the Statue of Liberty, but I gave it away. What state is this? New York, New York yes, I, yeah, the Statue of Liberty, I gave it away. So I went to New York and uh, my wife, she lives in upstate New York. So we went there and we rented an Airbnb, so we rented a house. And one day I was looking out the window with my younger sister and uh, I, I was surprised because it looked like there was just forest out there. And I asked her, I was like, do you think, do you think that, you know, there's, do we have any neighbors? Do we have any neighbors? And then she turned to the side of me on my right side and she saw this. She saw a barn and she said, yes, of course we have neighbors, right? Because there's a barn. And I, I remember thinking, I was like, subhanAllah, my, my younger sister, who's 13 years old, she knew that we had neighbors just because this thing existed, right? And this is essentially the foundation. This is the main argument why God exists. Because something cannot emerge from nothing. We've never seen it. Anything in this room, like your pen, this TV, your cap, your glasses, everything came from something. You and I, we came from something. Alhamdulillah, my mother's right there. I know where I came from, alhamdulillah. All of us came from something, right? Nothing just makes, makes itself, right? So this is the fundamental argument. Um, and it goes further than that, because assuming that our world was created by an intelligent being requires less faith than believing it randomly happened. So as a Muslim, you know, I believe that Allah created, the one God created the whole universe, okay? An atheist might say, no, this, this universe just randomly came to be. I'm saying, that his belief is more, it takes more faith than my belief. Because we don't have any examples in our world of something that just emerged out of nothing, right? So believing in a God takes less faith, less belief than actually believing something randomly happened, right? Okay, and that's a quote by myself, which I don't know why I included that, but okay. To put this into a very simple example, this is a water bottle by UBC. Um, any ideas how much this costs? Any guesses? $12.99? Close. $17.95 plus tax, plus 12%, right? Pretty expensive, I would say. But if you saw this water bottle, right, what are some of the specific features of it that obviously tell you that it was made by someone? Right? It has a cap. It has the UBC logo on it. Obviously, that didn't just fall from the sky and land on it, right? It's a clear water bottle. It has that blue little strip at the top. Something as simple as a water bottle 
obviously has a maker, right? This is just logic, obvious. So what about our respiratory system, which includes things in the English language that I may have trouble pronouncing, right? Like trachea and larynx and ep epiglobes, whatever that, anyways. Um, yeah, somebody can correct me on that, science is not my thing. Um, but essentially, if we know that a water bottle was made by someone or something, whether it be a machine or a human being, then what about this? What about our respiratory system? What about us? We have eyes that are like better than any camera out there, eyes that adjust to different things, right? Even the fact that we have, you know, eyelashes, right? Some people say, what's the point of having eyelashes, right? But have you ever, have you ever like worked out before? And, and you know, the sweat that kind of makes its way through down to your eyes, it stings, right? So these are basic things that tell us that we were intelligently made. And Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِينَ We made man, we created man in the best of stature, right? And this same argument applies to every, everything in our life, right? Pride and Prejudice. I had to read that book for an English literature class. I didn't necessarily enjoy it, but it had an author, right? The whatever that kitchen appliance is, it has a maker. Every single thing that we see has a maker. And this is why the universe and the complexities of the universe that we see, all of these are clear indications that they came from somewhere, right? And that is proof that Allah exists right there. So, just to summarize, nothing or something cannot emerge from nothing. We've never seen it before, and this is proof that Allah exists. And for, for atheists or, or people who say that the universe was like imperfectly made and all that stuff, I seriously challenge that because we have the perfect balance of, for example, like, I guess, phys like physical features. We have the perfect balance that ensure our livelihood. For example, the earth is tilted at a 23.5 degree angle. That gives us seasons. If it was straightforward, we may not have seasons, right? We are at a perfect distance away from the sun. If we were closer, we'd burn. If we were further away, we'd probably freeze. These are signs for people who think and for people who know. So it's important to really think about these things, right? when I think thinking essentially reinforces our faith as believers. And as Muslims, we believe that a belief in God isn't necessarily something that you have to come to find, right? The hadith says, Every human being is born with an innate belief in the one God, right? And then their parents make them Jewish or Christian or atheist or whatever. But internally, we know this. It's not something, that, it's not something that's new. Internally, we know it. So the second argument is the scriptural argument. And the scriptural argument is the Quran. Essentially, the Quran is proof that God exists. First of all, what is the Quran? If you were gonna summarize the Quran to a non-Muslim, how, how would you summarize it? What's a good definition of the Quran to a non-Muslim? Yes? The Word of God. The Word of God. <laughs> okay, the Word of God, okay? Okay, what's the difference, if somebody said, what's the difference between the Quran being the Word of God and the Bible being the Word of God? The Bible's not exactly, so the Bible is a collection of uh, history, a collection of like fables, a collection of all these different things, whereas in the Quran, we actually believe it is the speech of Allah. It yeah. is literally the words, like if you talk about the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not kill, thou yeah. shalt not, right? Like you can put God's quotes in parentheses, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, so the word Bible is Latin, I guess, or Greek for Biblos, which means a collection of books, right? So yeah, like you said, it, it's, they believe that revelation was given to these men, not necessarily revelation, but God inspired these men like John and Paul and this and that to write their books, to write these books. But the Quran, we believe that it's the verbatim word of God, right? So God is literally speaking to you, right, directly, right? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have believed, right? Do this and do this, right? So that's the difference. So thank you, yes, the Quran is essentially the verbatim word of God for Muslims. How is it proof that God exists? This is one of the ayahs in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is chapter two, verse number two. Allah says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أَلِفْ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ أَلِفْ three letters. This is a book about which there is no doubt, guidance for those who are conscious of Allah. I don't know about you, but I've never read any secular book whatsoever that starts out by saying this is a book about which there is no doubt. Even Charles Darwin's, right, 
Even Charles Darwin's book, published in 1859, you read it, it doesn't start out like this. Right? In fact, if you read Charles Darwin's book, he said, I don't have time to give you all the evidence. I'm paraphrasing. But in the introduction, he says, I don't have time to give you all the evidence. I trust that my reader will accept my statements. And this is, you can validate this in his book. So this is one of the proofs, or the fact that the Quran is free of contradictions, which I will talk about in the next verse, right? أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? If it was from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction. This is a very strong statement from God saying, if the Qur'an was, if a man wrote the Qur'an, you would find within it many contradiction. Now I've spoken to some uh, people who don't believe in the Qur'an and they say, well, you know, what if I wrote a book and it doesn't have any contradictions in it? Right? Does that mean it's the word of God? Like, I don't know, maybe Harry Potter. If you read Harry Potter, does it have any contradictions in it? I don't know. But that's a, it's a, that's a valid argument. But if you realize how the Quran was revealed, right? Over a span of how many years? How many years was it? 23 years. Imagine me telling my brother Rex over here a story every day. A story that I made up, right? I say one day there was a guy named John. John went to Moody Park to play basketball. Every day I give you a sentence, right? For 23 years, do you think that after 23 years you'd find some, some contradictions in it? If it's a made up story? I think you would, yeah. What if I wrote the book in advance and just came and reiterated the book uh, one sentence at a time? That's a valid argument, but we know Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was illiterate. So how could he have written, written the book <laughs> ahead of time, right? And I think people don't realize this because Assalamu alaikum. These are my students that just came in from uh, Islamic Academy. We actually saved for you some seats down here. So, came all the way from Coquitlam, mashallah. So, uh, sorry, remind me, Habibi, what you, what you <laughs> I lost my train of thought. You said about. Um, you answered the question. Okay, okay, yeah. So, essentially, the Quran, the fact that the book is so valid, it's free of any contradictions, it's free of any crookedness, it is proof that it came from God. And this is especially significant when we analyze how the Qur'an was revealed over a span of 23 years to a man who was illiterate in the desert, right? Thinking about that is really mind-boggling and it reinforces the idea that the Qur'an is the word of God. And the Qur'an goes further and that it gives you a challenge. Allah says in the Qur'an, this is, this is a very strong challenge and I pose it to any person who doesn't believe in the Qur'an. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you are in doubt about what we have sent down upon our servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then produce a chapter like it and call upon your witnesses other than Allah if you should be truthful. This is a very, very simple challenge. It's a very simple claim. And as far as I know, it's been 1400 years and no one's ever been able to do it. And I still pose this, and I was asked this, alhamdulillah, a couple weeks ago, at uh, Richmond Jamia Masjid, somebody says, how do you prove to an atheist that the Quran is the word of God? I would say, go to the Middle East, find the most prominent Arabic poet or prominent Arabic scholar that you know, tell him to come up with a chapter like the Quran, tell him to come up just with a chapter, call four witnesses, and let's put the two to the test. Right? And some of us, for some of us that may sound odd, but it's not really the first time that this has happened. Right? Another example is when um, Sayyidina Musa, he fared off against the magicians of Pharaoh. And what happened there? Anybody want to summarize the story? What happened? Four magicians against one prophet of God. What happened? Anyone? Do you know? Yes. Yeah, they believed in God right away because the snake that the, you know, when, when uh, Moses threw his staff and it turned into a snake, it immediately beat all the other ones, right? Essentially, the, Pharaoh challenged Pharaoh with something of this world, like magicians, right? But Pharaoh, or Moses, he had, he had, I guess, the guidance of Allah. And it shows you that when you challenge something from this world, when you put up the revelation of God and guidance from God against something from this world, they don't fare off in any way. And the same thing applies here, right? If, if somebody comes up with a chapter like the Qur'an and you compare it to the Qur'an, you'll see that there's no comparison. And Allah tells us this, right? But if you do not, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَن تَفْعَلُوا This is a very, very strong statement. 
If you do not, and you will never be able to. Allah is straight up telling us, you will never be able to replicate the Qur'an, right? Then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones prepared for the disbelievers. A'udhu Billah. So the Qur'an, once again, is proof that it is from God, right? And this is something that there is no, there's no doubt about, there's no shak, shak about or, or doubt, because it's, it, it, it's irreplicable, right? You can't do it. Now, there are other signs. So that's the first way in which the Qur'an proves that God exists. The other way is that the Qur'an directs you to natural signs that prove Allah exists. And we were going over this, uh, this verse with my grade three students, some of them are right here. Shafay, do you want to read the verse for us? I, I'm, I'm just joking, I don't, want to put, <laughs> I don't want to put that much pressure on you. But Jazakallahu khairan. Um, basically, the verse translates to mean, indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alteration of the night and day, and the great ships which sail through the sea, uh, with that which benefits people, and what Allah has sent down from the heavens of rain, and it goes on and on and on. All of these are signs for people, liqawmin yaqimun, for people who use reason. Okay? It's not random that we have day and night. Right? Like, this, this alone is something to really think about. That, so for somebody, like for example, atheists say, some of them say, matter collided with non-matter, the Big Bang happened, and then now we have, you know, gravity and perfect rotation and, you know, all this rotation in our galaxies. It just, it's not logical. The fact that we have alternation, alternating night and day. And what's more is that this night and day is consistent with our, with our actual capabilities as humans. Imagine if our days were like 48 hours. How would, how would we sleep, right? Because insomnia, one of, the reasons that, one of the things that causes insomnia is light, right? That's why people up north, they like blank out everything to, to try and sleep, right? So the fact that we have alternating day and night is a sign for people who use reason and for people who think, right? And it's just one of the many, many signs that Allah gives in the Quran. But this is why it's important to read the Quran. And this is another, subhanAllah, this is just looking at these pictures, it's subhanAllah, another, another sign. How we have, uh, this is what, what I really want to refer to. The phases of the moon, subhanAllah, before the Gregorian calendar, right? At, for example, the time of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him. How did people determine what month it was? How did people know, right? Because of this. Are you going to tell me that this is, if I smash two chairs together, I'm going to get a perfect rotation of, of a light switch over here that goes up and down by itself? It's not going to happen. Yes? I was Yeah. 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 And so the moon, in essence, is always there, but it just looks different to us. And so SubhanAllah. In that way, we kind of debunked the fact that the moon changes shape and stuff like that. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes when people speak about these things, okay, you might be able to explain, okay, maybe there is a cloud of the wind, maybe. But still, like in those specific shapes, each and every time throughout the month. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Right? It's that's it, like what are the chances of a cloud being in the same position every single month, in the exact same position, at the same time? What are the chances of a fairly random collision? Right? Like, I, I don't see how that, and that's only, that's, this is only one of the signs of Allah, subhanAllah. Um, but what you say even goes further, like, I'm, I'm telling you the signs of Allah's existence. And Allah tells us, right? He says, these signs do not avail the disbelievers, right? Allah says in the Quran, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the signs of Allah, most of the people on this planet are ghafilun. An ayatina ghafilun. They are basically heedless of our signs. So somebody might see in the moon, somebody might see the moon. I'll be honest with you. Growing up, and I was born and raised in the society, I went to public school here. I never really thought about something like this until I lived on a small island in Japan that had 390 people. Okay? I, I went there to work as an English teacher, alhamdulillah. I lived there for two years. 
The, the island was smaller than Stanley Park. A little bit smaller than Stanley Park. I lived there for two years, alhamdulillah. You can imagine on this island, you know, I'd go to work, I'd come home, I'd have a lot of free time. And this free time, long story short, it eventually challenged me to really seek out the truth and really reflect. The first time in my life I started thinking about, okay, does Allah exist? Is the Quran the word of God? Is, like, what about the moon? What about the sun? What about the fact that this water that we live on is like, it lets us float. Like when I'd be, when I'd be swimming, I'm like, this is quite interesting that my body actually floats in here. And this is what allows boats and stuff to travel, right? By sea, subhanAllah. So it's really important to not be heedless. And I, I get that we live in a society where everyone's super busy and stuff like that. But it's so, so important to really think because Allah says in the Quran, these are signs for people who think and for people who use reason. Right? So it's really important to, to have that reflection. But even what you said, like the rebuttal that I would give to the professor, how the moon doesn't change shapes, he's right. And Allah says this in the Quran, he says, shamsa sirajan wal qamara. He says, what means is munira, right? He uses two different words to describe the light of the sun and the light of the moon. Siraj is like a torch. And we know now that the sun has its own light, right? But for example, the moon does not have its own light, it's reflected light. I never realized that until I was like 20 something years old, right? Alhamdulillah, I'm 26 now, not too long ago. But still, like 2018, I could just Google it and I, did, I didn't know. I didn't know. So these are signs for people who use reason and for people who think. So, and we'll continue, inshallah, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So what about evolution? This is a big, big topic. What about evolution? Even if you were going to believe in every single thing that evolution says, everything, if you're going to accept all of it, we came from apes and all this, or we came from an ancestor of apes, you still need to explain to me where our universe came from. Because the theory of evolution does not even attempt to address the creation of our, our, of our universe. Which is why many scientists who believe in evolution still believe in God. Right? And you know, I could go in here and try to like break down all the evidences for evolution, like how you know, we, have, we share DNA with chimps and all that stuff. We also share 60% DNA with a banana. Am I really gonna say, you know, my great, 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 great cousin was a banana? No, right? But these are not signs. Like the, this alone in and of itself is not signs that we had a common ancestor by a completely random chance, right? That's my point. So I just wanna reiterate this. If you believe in evolution, that does not justify you disbelieving in Allah because you still need an explanation for the origins of the universe. I hope that's clear, inshaAllah. <laughs>